and I wanted to share this specific story um, from the Gospel of Luke because it, for me, I'm able to view God today, specifically how I'm able to view God as a Heavenly Father. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 15, <clears throat> Luke chapter 15 today. And the reason why um, this was so important and found this text was so foundational important in my life was because for the longest time, I had a really difficult time identi- like viewing God as a heavenly father. Viewing God as a father. It was hard for me to v- see that and to make that connection. A big reason for that was from just my own experience growing up. So my parents were divorced when I was three years old. And my dad, he, he wasn't around. Um, I'd see him, you know, at Christmas, you know, every once in a while. And every time I would see him, it would kind of always be the same deal. Like, we'd have a great time. And then at the end of the visit, he would, you know, say, hey, look, I'm really sorry about not being around. I'm sorry about everything. I'm going to be, I'm going to be better. We're going to see each other more, all that kind of stuff. And then months and months and months would go by and I wouldn't hear from him and then I would see him, and it would just be this sort of never-ending cycle, right? And then where he would promise to be better and all that, but better never happened. Better never came. Eventually, my mom remarried, <clears throat> and so I got a stepdad, and he was, he was great. I mean, he was, by all accounts, he was like the father of us. He was my brother and I that we, that we needed. Um, he loved my mom. He loved us. He was, you know, he was there for us. Um, and things were going really well until we learned that he was secretly hiding a pretty severe drug addiction. Um, and it had gotten worse and worse, and eventually to the point to where he wasn't, he wasn't working. Um, yeah, he wasn't working, and there was one evening, it kind of all came to a head one evening. Him and my mom, him and my mom are they're fighting, they're yelling at each other, and I hear him make a threat against my mom. And I was about 14 at the time. And so I come out of my room and I didn't say a word. I just took him by the shoulders. I was about this tall at 14. And so, so I thought I was going to be like, you know, getting for the NBA, but then at like 15, I kind of just stopped. So I was like, oh man. Um, But, you know, grabbed him by the shoulders and I just pushed him out the front door. And that was the last time that he was in our house. And that was the last time that I ever saw him. And so, but it was around that time in my life, the same time that I started attending church. And I started going to a youth group. And when I started going, I would hear all this time, this language about God being a father. You know, about God being a, And it was really hard for me to see that. <clears throat> and it was really hard for me to, uh, to reconcile that. Right? I kept seeing how there's a close relationship between God and the idea of a father. God, the father, right, is part of the Trinity. You know, Jesus referring to God as his father. And when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray, he says, pray like this. You start by our father, right? But again, because of my experiences with earthly fathers and in trusting in them over and over again only to be hurt, I didn't like to view God as a father, um, because that word, father, was synonymous with pain and with disappointment. So when I knew that this was really going to be an issue for me in my about God, when I read this quote from A.W. Tozer, who said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. See, Jesus is clear when he teaches that God is our heavenly father. Right, but I needed help to change the way that I think about him as a father. So what I'm going to do with our time today, I'm going to share with you the story that Jesus told that helped to change my view and to change my perspective of my relationship with God as my heavenly father. But what we do, let me just pray one more time. Father, we love you. And God, I pray that over these next few moments um, that we are in your word, that you would speak clearly, you would speak powerfully <clears throat> in this place today. And that every word from my mouth would be from you. And then any word that is not from you would just fall on deaf ears. In Jesus' name, amen. So Luke chapter 15, again, so we're going to be today in Luke 15. This is a, for some context, right? Luke 15 is about this chapter that is made up uh, entirely of parables. 
entirely a parable. So we've talked about this last week, you know, but parables, there's stories that Jesus would tell um, to drive home a lesson, to drive home a specific point. So they weren't necessarily like, um, you know, historical accounts. They were, you know, just, again, Jesus was an incredible storyteller. There were stories that Jesus would tell. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, so what's going on here is Jesus is surrounded by sinners and by tax collectors, right? He's surrounded by the lowest people on the societal totem pole, right? People that everybody looks down on and people want nothing to do with. And, he's, so they, and the sinners and the tax collectors are coming to Jesus and they're asking about him because they're hearing about the works that he's doing. They're hearing about the miracles. They're hearing about all the, the lessons that he's teaching, all of that. And they want to they see Jesus. They want to meet Jesus and all that. And so while this is going on, the Pharisees, who are the religious leaders of the time, the Pharisees start complaining. They're kind of muttering amongst themselves. And they're like, hey, if, if this is Jesus if he was really who he said he was, if he was really such a great prophet and such a great teacher and all of that, if he was really all these things, then why would he surround himself with those people? Why would he surround himself with those types of people? And so then Jesus, to kind of set them in their place, he tells them this story. So Luke 15, starting in verse 11, uh, says this. He also said, a man had two sons, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. So we have a man that has two sons, right? And one of the sons goes to this father and asks for his inheritance, right? And in the ancient Middle East, this would have been incredibly offensive, right? This would have been like going up to your parents and saying, hey, mom, dad, like, I love you. You're great. But like, honestly, I just want what's coming to, like, if you could just, like, die, and I can get my inheritance, that would be awesome, right? Like, we would never do that. You know, I, my mom is Puerto Rican, right? If I would have gone to my Puerto Rican mother and said, hey, mom, can you just drop dead and give me your inheritance? <laughs> that chancleta would be, like, ready to go, like David and Goliath with his swing, you know, with the sling, you know? I'd be walking with a limp until I'm 70, you know? So, this would have been highly offensive for this, this son to say to his father, hey, just give me your inheritance or give me my inheritance. Right? But that's not how the father in this story responds. The father in the story, he doesn't get offended. He doesn't like reach back, you know, like he doesn't do any of that. The father in the story um, listens to him. He gives him his share of the estate and then the son goes away to a far country. Right? And if you're anything like me, one of the first questions we have to ask is why? Like, why would the son do this incredibly offensive, shameful thing? Like, why would he do that? You know, when he's with his father for him, he's safe, he's cared for, his needs are met. But that wasn't enough for him. Right? See, he didn't want to be under his father's authority. Right? He had his own ways that he wanted to live his life. He knew what was best for himself and wanted to live his life his own way. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound familiar? How, um, how many of us are kind of getting flashbacks to like, you know, your first year going to college, right? When you move away and it's like, wait, I'm, I'm no longer under my parents' authority. Well, I can do whatever I want. Like what in the world? Right? We all have our own um, we all have our own stories and plenty of examples, right, of, of defying authority, right? But listen to what Jesus says next as Jesus continues. He says, Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all that he had, and he traveled to a distant country where he squandered his estate in foolish living. And after he had spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. So he goes away from it. He goes away loving it. His father is, and he spends everything. And for a season, he's probably loving it, right? He's no longer under his father's authority. He's got his inheritance. He's got money. Like, he's, he's, for a season, he's probably having a great time, right? We don't know exactly what he spent all the money on, but we know from later on in the story when his brother, uh, from what his brother has to say, that he spent some of the money on prostitutes, Right? So he's not here living a great godly life. You know, like, no, he is, he's doing some bad things. Right? He is totally wasting it all. <clears throat> um, he's living this crazy lifestyle. 
until eventually he's got nothing left. He spent it all. He spent everything. And then the famine comes. The famine comes and he's got nothing left. The famine comes and he is not prepared. All right, so he's separated from his father. He's in a far country by himself. He spent everything. And now what is famine? And so he's desperate, right? He's hungry. He's desperate. So what is, what is his response to this situation? The response is, it says, then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. He sells him, his response is to sell himself to a citizen of that country and spend his days feeding pigs. His response is not to go running back to his father. His response is to go deeper and deeper into the far country, to separate himself even more from his father. He's trying, to, he's, he's trying to fix the problem himself, and then he's making it a lot worse, right? He's, again, he's got no money. He's hungry. The famine is here, and he's looking at the, he sells himself into slavery, and he's looking at the pigs eating from the trough. And have you ever seen a pig eat from a trough? It's disgusting. It's disgusting. And he's looking at that and going, and he's jealous. <laughs> and he's like wishing he could eat like that, but no one's giving him anything. Right? This is the state that he's in. He's, he was trying to fix the problem himself, and he's ended up making it much worse. Right? And that's, we do that, we do that, right, all the time, and today. You know, I was, again, when I was, uh, when I was a kid, my brother and I, you know, for a while, my mom was, you know, a single mom, so she's working a lot, and so it was one afternoon after school, we're home, and we're just being, you know, middle school boys, right? We're wrestling around, roughhousing, all that kind of stuff, and at some point, I don't remember exactly how it happened, but at some point, we made a hole in the wall, right, hole in the drywall, and it was that classic, like, from a movie, record scratch moment, right, where, like, everything stopped, and we looked at this hole in the wall, and we saw our life flash before our eyes, <laughs> and we were like, oh, no, like, we have to do something <laughs> to fix this, right? But we're in middle school. We don't know how to fix drywall, right? I still don't know how to fix drywall. And so, <laughs> we're like, what, how, what are we going to do here? So, what we ended up doing was we took a piece of paper, and we just wrote a love letter to our mother, about how beautiful she is, how grateful we are for her, how much we love her, all of these things. And we took it and we taped it over the hole. And our thought was, man, she's gonna come home and she's gonna see that letter and just be blown away and just be filled with love. And she's gonna keep it there until we turn 18 and move out and take us to Blockbuster. And you know, you guys remember Blockbuster, right? Throwback probably don't remember Blockbuster. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was great. I'll tell you about it after. Um, <laughs> it'll be part of Essentials. No. <laughs> um, and so anyway, so we take this thing in the wall and we're like, you know, just, yeah, that's our plan. My mom comes home from work and of what she sees it immediately rips it off the wall because she knows this is not you. What, what's going on? And so we got in trouble for making a hole in the wall but we got in more trouble because we lied about it and we tried to cover it up, right? We weren't honest. We were trying to be deceitful with it, right? And manipulative right? and how we were wording the letter and all that. So instead of, hey, we made the mistake and then instead of just owning, it, owning up to it when she got home, we lied about it. We tried to cover it up. And so our consequences were worse because of that. And the son in the story is dealing with this problem in the same way. He's faced with famine, and instead of just owning the fact that he had nothing, he decided to travel even further away from his father and into an even worse situation. The son's literally at rock bottom, right, but decided that selling himself into slavery was more attractive than going back to his father, right? And maybe, maybe it was shame, right? Maybe it was shame. Maybe, you know, hey, he insulted his, he insulted his dad, so maybe for a combination, he wouldn't want anything to do with him anymore, or maybe it was pride. Maybe it was just pride or a, com or a combination of the two, right? But that's a dangerous place for us to be because look what happens to him. 
when he does this. You know, his, his life doesn't get any better. He doesn't escape the famine. In fact, Jesus says again that he's so hungry that he's longing to eat from the pods that the pigs were eating from, but no one would give him anything. And this is what happens to you. This is what happens to me. This is what happens to all of us when we run from God. When we run from God. When we take the gifts that he has given us and we misuse them or we just throw his gifts away, then we're left with nothing but pig scraps. But here's the good news. Right? I think that Jesus is implying here that being in the pig scraps, while messy and painful, can sometimes be exactly what someone needs in order to have their eyes open to just how valuable what they had truly was. In other words, pain, pain has a way of drawing us closer to God. And maybe you've experienced that in your own life, right? Pain can be the best teacher. You know, I was, again, my mom's side of the family, they're Puerto Rican. My dad's side of the family, they're all like from Kentucky and Florida, right? So, um, if you know, down there, right, like every household, you got a cast iron skillet. I know people use cast iron skillets up here too, but down in South, it's like part of like the starter pack that you get when you live there. You get a Bible, a gun, and a cast iron skillet. It's like, welcome to the South. And so it was, uh, it, you know, if you use the cast iron skillet, right, you know those things, they stay hot for a long time, right? They don't just cool off right away. So my grandma would always say, like, hey, when the, cast, when the skillet's on the stove, just assume that it's hot, right? Just don't ever touch it. Just don't ever touch it. I'm a kid. I'm taught to do something. What am I going to do? So I go, and I touched it, and you know what? It was hot, <laughs> and I had a giant blister, and it hurt, but that pain was a lesson because I have never... T- I use a cast iron skillet multiple times a week, and to this day, even when I'm the one that cooked with it, I still am, like, looking at it, like... Are you safe yet? Like, I don't know. You know, like I'm still wary because that pain works. The pain teaches us lessons. And so it was at this place that the son finally came to his senses. Right? When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up, go to my father, and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. He finally realizes that the right thing to do here is for him to just go back to his father. And notice what he says here, though, right? He knows that his the man takes care of his servants and provides for them, which is a stark contrast to the man that he has been working for in this far country. So he's walking back to his father, and he's thinking to himself, okay, look, there's no way that my father's going to welcome me back like as a son, as part of the family. Again, I've shamed him. I've dishonored him. There's no way. But maybe if I plead and if I beg, maybe he'll take me back as a servant, right? Because I, at least I know his, he takes care of his servants. This guy that he's working with in this far country does not. But my father at least takes care of his servants. So if I can at least be a servant, hey, I'll have food. <laughs> I'll have clothes. I'll have water. Right, like I can at least just, I can at least just do that. <clears throat> look what where he, but I mean, but he knows like, hey, I'm not worthy to be his son anymore because of what I did. And look at what his look at where his journey has taken him, right? Because of everything he's been through, he's gone from at the beginning, he's gone from saying I don't want to be your son, to now he's saying I'm not worthy enough to be your son. You see the change of heart that has taken place. Because through the journey he's been on, how the pride has turned into humility, into brokenness. And this is a beautiful picture here of repentance, of us turning our backs to sin, turning our backs to the far countries that we go to, and in humility, going back to our Father. And then this right here, this is my favorite part of the story. My favorite part of the story. Jesus said, but while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him, and was filled with compassion. And he ran through his arms around his neck and kissed him. The father sees his son off in the distance coming back home and he rushes out to meet him. He doesn't 
wait for him to get there and plead his case. Right? He doesn't, um, you know, he doesn't go out and you know shake his hand. He doesn't go out there and like give him a big, like a huge lecture about, yeah, I told you so. This is why. Blah, blah, blah. Like, no, he doesn't do any of that. He kisses, rushes out, and hugs him. His heart is filled with compassion. He hugs him and he kisses him. Keep in mind, he's been like feeding pigs, and he's walked from this far country. He's got no shoes, right? He's dirty. He's filthy. And his father doesn't care. He just sees his son and greets him, hugs him, and greets him with a kiss. And then right as the son starts to go into his, like, prepared speech that he's been working on about, like, you know, hey, maybe I can just come be a servant, all of that. And right when, the, right when that, um, the son starts to do that, the father hushes him up and says to his, he calls out to his other servants and says, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it and let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now these three gifts that the father gives the son are incredibly important, right? They're important because they're men, practical needs, but they're also symbolically very important. See the robe that he's given, right? It signifies it's, it's honor. You know, again, he's naked, he's dirty, he's filthy. So the robe signifies um, honor. The ring is a symbol of authority, right? And then the, the original audience the, that Jesus is talking to at this time, they'd recognize that this would, be, this would have been a signet ring, right? Which is what, a ring that they would wear, that people would wear and could basically mean like, hey, no matter where you go in the world, if people see you wearing that ring, they know that you're my son. They know that you act under my authority, right? So... <clears throat> the ring um, gives them, yeah, this is a symbol of authority. And then also, in those times, a lot of slaves that worked inside on, they were not permitted to wear sandals. They're not permitted to wear sandals. So by giving his son a pair of sandals, he's saying, I don't want you as a slave. I want you as my son. These gifts were all answers to the son's prayer. The robe is the answer to I have sinned. Well, here's honor. The ring is the answer to, I'm not worthy to be called your son. And the sandals are the father's answer to his request, just be a servant. And guys, I hope that you can see that this is the gospel. This is the gospel. That when we are lost and dead in our sins and finally come to the point to where we realize our need for a savior, that God, our father, is there. And maybe you're thinking, you know, but Brandon, like you don't, you don't know me. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I've done. You don't know any of this. I don't deserve forgiveness. And let me tell you, you're right. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. None of us deserve forgiveness. That's why the scriptures say that we are saved by grace, by grace. It's nothing that we have done. It's by grace. Your heavenly father is not in heaven going, well, he's too far gone or she has messed up too many rush times, I'm done with her. No, he's waiting for you to come home and he's rushing out to meet you and to clothe you in the robe of the righteousness of Christ. And so with the ring of authority on your finger and sandals on your feet to show the world that you are not worthless, that you are not what the voices in your head and in your heart say that you are, that you are who God says that you are, that you are his child. God came to meet us as Jesus while we were still a long way off, while we were dead in our sins, Jesus came for us and it's his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection on the third day that allows us to have a relationship with God the Father. We can't do anything to save ourselves So he came and made the way for us. And because of this, when we come to the Father, he doesn't see us as servants begging to eat scraps from the pigs. No, he sees us all lost, his children, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, where we were all lost and now we're found. You know, and I really wanted to 
dig in uh, more to the second half of the story that has to deal with the older brother. Um, but because of, just because of time, we're not going to be able to get into all that today. But I do want to highlight, um, I do want to highlight a couple things. <clears throat> now remember the context of this passage, right, of Luke 15. Jesus is talking to a group of religious leaders that are asking him why he is spending so much time, <clears throat> excuse me, they're asking him why he's spending so much time with sinners and with tax collectors. Um, and the next few verses here, um, the, we have the brother, the brother who sees this celebration going on for his younger brother, and he doesn't understand it, right? So he goes to his father, and he's like, hey, I don't get it. Like, I've been with you this whole time. You know, he left, my brother left you, and he wasted his inheritance. He offended you. He basically told you to drop dead, Right? And he went and he wasted your inheritance. He did this. And I, I've been here with you the whole time. I'd never left your side. Why are we celebrating him? And the father tells him, Son, he said to him, You are always with me, and everything that I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. You see, the older brother's heart had become so hardened by his own pride that he wasn't able to have understanding or compassion in seeing his younger brother come home. And Jesus is telling the religious leaders, that's you. You are the older brother. You are so focused on making the outside look good, on looking religious, that you haven't even realized that your heart is far from me as well. He's talking to the Pharisees, but it's a good warning for us. It's a good warning for you. It's a good warning for me. When I was preparing for this message, I came across this quote from John Ortberg, and it hit me like right in the heart. He says, one of the hardest things in the world is to stop being the prodigal son without turning into the older brother. One of the hardest things in the world is to stop becoming the prodigal son without turning into the older brother. It's so easy for us to think, you know, man, hey, I, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that, right? So therefore, I'm better than everybody else, right? No, Jesus is saying that by thinking those things, by having that, that pride within you, that you're just as lost because your pride is making you a prodigal. You know, a few years ago, about five years ago at now at this point, um, my dad and I had a long talk on the phone. He called and when I saw his name pop up on my phone, I kind of looked at Danielle, and I was like, here we go again, you know, like one of those things. But I answered the phone, and, you know, sure enough, he was um, in tears, and he was apologizing for everything and how he wishes things could have been different growing up, and he wishes he was better, and, and all, those, all, this types, all this type of stuff. <clears throat> um, and, he, and in the moment, there on the phone, I was able to forgive him. I was able to forgive him. And you know what? Things aren't perfect between he and I. Um, they most likely never will be. But there is forgiveness and there's reconciliation. And I remember telling him on the phone, look, and I'd never told him this before. I'd never told him this before, but I was able to tell him, you know, I don't care what you did, right? That was, that's in the past. That's in the past. You're my dad and I love you. And I was only able to do that. I was only able to do that because of the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, the Spirit reminded me that, hey, this is what I say to you all the time, Brandon. That yes, you sin. Yes, you mess up. Go son, right? But you're my son and I love you. See, the story of the prodigal son taught me that it doesn't matter what my earthly father did or did not do, right? Because I have a perfect heavenly father that loves me, that corrects me, that calls me his own and is running out to meet me. And he's running out to meet you too, wherever you are, whichever far country you are in, your heavenly father is waiting for you. He's calling out to you to turn your back to whichever far country that you're running to and to come running home. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And God, I thank you for your grace. 
and I thank you for your mercy towards us. Jesus, I pray that you would help all of us, that you would help all of us, Lord, to stop becoming the prodigal son without becoming the older brother. Help us to recognize that everything that we have is because of grace and because of grace alone. Help us to kill our pride and help us to trust you. Lord, if any of us, if any of us are running off to far countries right now, God, I pray that you would help us to stop, to turn our backs to it, and to come running back to you, and that we would see you right there rushing out to meet us. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.